Hello and welcome everybody. Welcome to Oz by Drone. I'm Greg. I'm John. Hey folks, how you doing? Great to be back. Absolutely, absolutely. Welcome back, John. You've been away for so long. I have. I've been away for so long. I think the last time I caught up, we're at the uh, Avalon Air Show. I know I was down there and uh, I've been down in South Australia, been flying all over the place, having a great time. Um, but I've been missing the show. And of course, you know, I wasn't the only one that were away. You spent uh, nearly a month in uh, Korea. I had a great that? time. I had a great time in Korea. Just before we go on, I'll tell you about that in a second, but I got some echo on my side. So in the rendezvous dashboard to my lovely, beautiful wife, I'll get you on the third one on the right-hand side to change that from road to HDMI. Uh, not HDMI. Uh, oh, that'll do. Let's see how that works. So yeah, Korea, it was absolutely awesome. And um, I, I went to an airfield. Have you seen that video yet, John? I have, yeah, fantastic. I noticed that you, go, you had some great aviation stuff over there as well and yeah. did some good flying and also the great DJI store, which was right next door to where you were staying. So, yeah, I, I caught all that stuff, um, kept up with you on social media. But it's good to be back and uh, I hope the folks haven't all left us in droves thing. we've been away for a while. We have. But I, I tell you what, I couldn't have stayed anywhere better it's the place we stayed. It's a, a town called Hongdae, H-O-N-G-D-A-E. And it's totally not a hotel district. It's close to a university called Honggik University. So the accommodation we stayed in, for all I know, may have been student accommodation or something. It was a small little two-bedroom apartment. Great, great, great place and just on Airbnb. But if you stay there, you as a musician as well, well, a drummer, but as, yeah, as an entertainer, drummer. as an entertainer, let's just <laughs> use that. Um, it, it would be a great place to stay because every night you go out, you've got busking, you've got entertainment, you've got magicians, you've got yeah, anything. Yeah. It's just happening all there. Yeah, no, it's a great place. It's quite a, quite a cosmopolitan and very um, artistic city as well. So I'm, I'm glad you joined. I've been lucky enough to have been there myself and, um, you know, it's, it's a great place to go and play. And enjoy and the food. I mean, what can you say? <laughs> Anywhere. The food, you know, the food was go. good except for one day I had this chicken from this place and let's just say I didn't enjoy the next day. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. That wasn't a chicken to have. All right, on with the show. On with the show. Let's get into the news. What do you got first up today, mate? First up, being an Australian-based show in a, only an Australian moment, a man has captured with a drone a kangaroo having a dip at a, a stunning Queensland beach. Bundaberg local Jamie Fleming filmed the marsupial swimming in the crystal clear waters at um, Kinkuna Beach on Sunday morning. On his personal Facebook page, he wrote, managed to capture this little fella playing in the waves. He was having a good old time. Was he really? I mean, do kangaroos swim in the surf? This is the first I've heard. I it's mean, the was, first it, was I've he really heard missing it? It's the first... I've ever heard of it. I don't know. I, I, I think it's more likely that he went out there by accident, by mistake, but yeah. Oh, I know. I mean, getting caught. I mean, he probably, it might have been hot for sure, but jumping in the surf, I mean, if you think about it, after, you know, uh, thousands and thousands, tens of thousands years of evolution, if the kangaroos thought, hey, yeah, the swimming's kind of fun, that's a way to cool off, let's go and do that. What well, you know, he's the only one that figured mm. it out. I don't know, marsupials and getting in the surf, you know, you don't see you don't see too many other marsupials getting in the water, do you? It just doesn't feel right. But anyway. I well, mean, it, um, if you do want to check it out, the, the link's in the description. Bucker Retreat is the name of the Facebook page where that one came from. So do yeah. go and check that out and maybe you can stay up there and have some fun. Cool. Well, well for all our international guests, yeah, kangaroos, they swim all the time. And they can get wings, they fly too, you know. They do all that down here. They fly as well. So, you know, you just hang around. We'll show you it all. You know, we've got, we got it all. <laughs> yeah. So moving on from that, AUVSI is the Association for Unmanned Vehicle Systems International. But the AU in AUVSI perhaps should relate to Aussies. At the recent event, one drone operator was willing to tell all at the event and spill the beans on what equipment was being used by Hollywood. The really cool point is that one of the big names comes from the land down under, the XM2. Whoops, we lost that. <laughs> Take two. There it is. So 
So this is just their, their showreel of some stuff shot with their aircraft, but I think it's really cool to have Hollywood um, using Australian, um, you know, the company as an Australian company. Yeah, very nice. Have you have you played with them, John, or have you heard about no, them before? I have heard about them. Yeah, they're good. They're just basically a good lifter. Um, I'm not sure of the tech, whether they're um, a, a cube-based um, autopilot or, you know, a mod, a, a I don't think it would be cube-based because the interesting thing is the, the showreel was actually a couple of years old when I pulled it off um, their website. But um, yeah. we can go right back off the cube, of course, earlier, the earlier pick talk. Um, technology, sure. you know, developed up. Uh, it is. It's really a quite a high level um, uh, at the moment. You know, but there you go. There's the frame. Um, yeah. And so, you know, well, it, it it is a good thing. It's obviously a turnkey. One of the things about getting a camera um, aircraft right like that is having the camera bit right, having enough uh, control over the camera in terms of. Uh, all of the various functions that the camera is able to do and have a second operator do it. Um, hmm. the, the airplane part is quite simple, you know, provided it's stable and it, and it has a, a good um, range and, and quick way to change the batteries. Um, hmm. And that's why the Inspire has done so well. You know, the, yeah. Inspire, the Inspire 2 particularly is a, a really, really good airplane. But, of course, it does, you know, it won't carry uh, some of the cameras that Hollywood wants to use. So, um, yeah. you know. That's the way to do it. I like the X8 for, for camera ships, although they're very, very smooth. And because when you when you start hanging expensive cameras, like real expensive cameras, um, on on the, your aircraft, you want it to be fairly reliable. Without saying, goes without yeah. saying. If you want to see more about that, we've um, got a link to um, the the source website in the description. Encourage you to go there and have a look as well. But speaking yep. of the XM2, this particular camera. Has, as I said, been around for a while, but um, the aircraft, but it's very futuristic in their thinking because the equipment was recently used in the filming of the latest Star Wars episode, The Rise of Skywalker. Just got their trailer there for a little bit of a quick look. Yeah, good. We've passed on all we know. A thousand generations live in you now. But this is your fight. So we might cut that a little bit early. We we all understand the wonders of um, Star Wars, yeah, look but at that. certainly some beautiful, beautiful drone shots and drone photography in there. And again, using the XM2, yeah, Australian right. well, tech. You know, a lot of the um, a lot of the interesting things we've got because of these films are basically CGI based. Um, you know, generated. Um, but of course, having these days having aerial photography in such a um, you know an affordable um, and robust way to you do it more and more, we're seeing um, drone footage in films yeah. rather than rather than knocking up the CGI. You know, it, obviously it's quick and and it has a different feel to it as well. You know, you can you can definitely feel some of those low level shots where you're flying along very very low level pod um, racer style. Um, perfect. Uh, shoot them you know they don't need to be cgi that can be shot with a with a drone yeah okay moving on to our third story of the day and this one is another australian story a drone has captured the eerie moment when a gray nurse shark passes by a school of fish to launch 
the uh, pursuit of a swimmer who has no there idea of his presence. Are you sure it wasn't chasing a kangaroo? <laughs> I, I was waiting for that punchline there. I was going <laughs> to ask you about that. But anyway, um, this was on Bondi Beach. In the video, you can see how the animal goes directly to the swimmer. It's just going after it. Although, fortunately, seconds later, it turns and suddenly changes direction. So, Ken Heron, come to Australia. It's going, it's going quite close to that swimmer, bro. Oh, no. Nice work. Looks like he's, he's uh, a couple of meters. Yeah, yeah not, no, it's only a small shot. Yeah. Far out. That was that quite a. He was definitely was going really that way, wasn't he? Yeah. He was, he was. No, no question so about that. The shark that. was sort of thinking, yeah, that was what's quite that? unusual oh, behavior. Yeah, yeah, maybe not. Yeah. I'll go back over to where the fish were. Look out, bro. bro. Look out, bro. We'll leave that there. But That's it's great. a cool, cool video. Yeah, isn't it? Well, you say it's been happening for, for as long as we've been in the water. You don't usually know. You don't see it. You don't see what's underneath. Yeah, okay. but all of these uh, Americans coming to Australia, I think it was probably an American swim. It must have been. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. Okay. Moving on from that little bit of high tech, Apple. Apple um, Park has um, a rainbow stage in the middle. Drone videographer Duncan Sinfeld <laughs> uploaded his latest footage of Apple Park on Wednesday. Most noticeable is the new rainbow stage right in the heart of the company headquarters. The stunning video also gives you a sense of the sheer scale of the location. Yes, look at that. That really is that big. Where is that? Where did this is the that Apple was? headquarters. Oh man! So this is the interesting thing. Darren's been shooting this year after year after year as the building and the Apple headquarters was getting built. And um, you know, he, this is just one of his videos. I strongly encourage everyone watching. It's really cool. Go to his channel, link in the description, and have a look back at the timeline uh, as this building's getting built. Man, that's insane. And beautiful piloting work How too. Many, oh, absolutely. And the light's great too. Look at that. You know, you've got that golden light working um, and, and really helping to, to show the angular, uh, uh, you know, detail in the building. Yeah. That's really nice. Beautiful, work, beautiful. Man. We'll leave that great there crap. and as we move on to our next clip, but very, very nice. Oh. That's insane. Where, what's the location, Greg, again? What, what, where is it? Um, in in uh, Cupertino, isn't there? Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, wow. Well, yeah. That just knocked me out. I mentioned let's, you had to um, go across Let's cut the other back side. and we'll leave that clip got a, there. You've got a bike inside there. Do you ride around that thing? <laughs> I mean, you know, I'd get lost. Yeah, look, it's it's really, really cool. I like it. Yeah, it is great. Well done. As we move from that, we've got another really cool drone-based um, clip. This one, um, it's related to skiing, but this is a night drone flight, and it's entitled Heat Seeker. So four years ago, the Swiss free skier and filmmaker Nicholas I hope I get his name right, Vingnia. <laughs> I think I did well. Um, he had the well. idea. He had the idea of lighting a night skier using a drone. After a great deal of planning and work, this four-minute short film, Heat Seeker, um, is what resulted. Features beautiful footage of a skier hurtling down the mountainside at night under the glow of a drone-mounted flare. Um, he said, "We explored various ways to achieve this effect." It was a long and sometimes frustrating creative process marked by many cold nights. Drone features six of the world's best free riders and was shot in Valais in the Swiss Alps. Police, what's your emergency, please? There's something flying over our house. Um 
Well, it's coming towards me now. It's almost lights blazing. I don't know what the hell it is. Challenging fly right there. There is a lot of challenging flying in that. I'll just cut the music because he's got a license to use it and I don't. So let's just talk about it for a couple of moments, though. Some absolutely insane filming, both filming the skier going down the hill and the creative, you know, strapping a flare to a drone in the first place. Yeah, that's right. Because you've got to remember when the when the flare, uh, everybody's in the dark. <laughs> Once that goes out and, um, yeah, you, you've got to have <clears> some kind of way of lighting the place or making some uh, – you're going to lose your aeroplane if you're not careful. The skier yeah. might – the skier might uh, – oh, I would have to know. You go oh, – you know, for, for my mind, you practice this over mm. and over and over again in the daylight. So, you know, exactly probably Ooh. running waypoint um, flight as well, which would be the safest way to do it. I'm just going to pause there. I got a message from um... – someone telling me that YouTube is not up, but we are recording. Um, just let me have a look. It doesn't say 10 watching. It says 10 waiting. Huh? We're still getting echo here from uh, you today with a new version, but that's okay. It's manageable. So um, let me just have a quick not going little... up. Have a quick look. YouTube live dashboard. Well, while you're recording, Greg, I'll, I'll just throw in my little bit of news about Bevelos for those that are still Look, listening. I'll tell you what. Here we go. I, I pressed this start streaming button ages ago, and the good news is that we've recorded the beginning of this. Start preview player accurately. I, just bear with me right now, and we'll stitch this together later. Okay. Something YouTube has had fun with us today. So for those who are just joining us now, we've actually been talking and doing the first 15 minutes of the show and there was some really good news and really good footage. You'll have to watch it. You have to go back and watch it later. Check it out. So what's going to happen, um, there's this live version that's got the chat and there's going to be another version that we're going to upload later that's going to have the first 15 minutes. So... I clicked the start button and then I left that window alone and continued talking and doing our regular stuff and don't know what happened. We'll have a look at it later and see if we can stitch it back together. So welcome back. Welcome back. Here we are. We're still here. I'm still here. I can yeah. see Darren's in the back. Our guest's in the background waiting as well, uh, having a good chuckle. He's over in Perth. It must be dark over there still. I don't know. Three hours. No, two hours now, isn't it? Two hours yeah. different. So yeah. look, attaching onto our news, Greg, and the story that we just had, um, uh, while you catch up there with the technical stuff, um, the beef loss for Australia is um, uh, under the new manual of standards. So um, those of you that get these notifications from CASA will realise on April the 9th, um, the one month ago, we had a notification from CAFA that the, finally the manual of standards, the long-awaited three years manual of standards, was released um, with all sorts of goodies in it. It's got five chapters written, and then six, seven, eight, nine, ten are not finished um, in the MOS. But one of the great things in there is beyond visual line of sight. So pretty much uh, universally um, in drone operations, you, there was a requirement that you have to see the drone with your own eyes, be able to navigate it, but of course, you know, and not use binoculars or anything, use uncorrected vision. So that's what we've had in Australia. And now we're moving to operators being having what they call extended visual line of sight, which means you can fly FPV or looking at your screen with an observer beside you, but the observer doesn't actually have to be able to see the aircraft exactly or the drone exactly. It only, ha it only has to know the exact position and be able to see the airspace around the aircraft to mitigate risk to man aircraft. Wonderful stuff. This is uh, what emergency services, Australian Federal Police, life-saving, everyone's been pushing for so that we're not breaking the rules or breaking the law, as everyone uh, has been for many, many years. Now there's um, provision there um, to know, and we do, you do know where the aircraft is at 1,500 metres, 
Mm. Now, in, a, in an extended visual line of sight class two, you can have multiple tra- daisy chained observers that clear the airspace and so you can fire longer distances up to, um, Castle says, 80% of the manufacturer's stated range um, at 500 feet. Great stuff. The technicalities um, are many, uh, but if you want to go and check it out, go and Google Manual of Standards or MOS, uh, CASA, um, on the website there, and you can download those and look at Chapter 5. So Chapter 5 of the MOS, exciting for everybody, a new day. It's probably the biggest thing to happen over here in terms of regulatory reform that we've had since the excluded category uh, mm. in 2016. So exciting stuff. Go check it out. Yeah, it sounds good. So just to clarify, that manual of standards, though, would apply only to REPL slash REOC? They are. Um, that It will affect people coming into the industry because they've in Chapter 2 they've redefined uh, what it's going to take to get your license. So in 12 months' time, it's going to be harder to get a license to fly um, uh, REPL than it will be to have a private pilot license from manned aircraft. Um, so, Which totally makes sense. Well, it does. Of course it does. If you, um, I, I had this discussion the other day and, you know, I've been flying um, commercially flying manned aircraft my whole life. I can remember when I got my private pilot license, um, it was pretty straightforward, 40 hours of experience. But a private pilot goes out, um, tops into their Cessna, um, tackies along the yellow line, takes off on the runway, does the radio calls. Everything is very much um, controlled uh, around, mm. you know, the weather that you can fly in. Everything is very much bolted into safety. When you're flying a drone, um, commercially or otherwise, you have to – what you're conducting is when you go to take off, you are doing a dynamic risk assessment. That's mm. the way we come. And to do, to have the skill to do a risk assessment that it takes in all of the elements of risk where you're flying, what they might be. And look, it might be very low risk operational site. There's nobody around. It's, um, it's non populous area, all of that sort of stuff. Very low risk. You make that assessment. But as things get more complicated, you're going to go to a shopping center and you mm. want to photograph, uh, you know, or even look at the, the building, the, the um, photos earlier in the show of the new Apple headquarters. So mm. there, there, that is a complicated, um, maybe there was no one there, um, uh, which, you know, I couldn't see any people at all, the building probably early Sunday morning or whatever. Um, so, but I, and managing those risks is complicated. And so, yeah, it, it, that's where they're going to target. They can actually have a, a, more, compli- a, a more comprehensive course that helps um, uh, drone pilots really manage risks and have the benefit of flying beyond visual line of sight, flying at night, flying Mm. uh, tethered operations, all the stuff that we want to do. But just let me check it one more time, make sure I got it clear. The stuff in the manual of standards does not apply to recreational pilots. So if you want to do BV lost flights, you need to get your REPL under the new training regime when it comes in, et cetera, et cetera, and have incorporated the manual of standards and have appropriate processes and procedures. That is correct. That is correct at the moment. Okay. Be interesting to have a look at. Guys, I just want to apologize again. We just had a little chat about Bevelos as a quick diversion. We were going to do it later on in the show. but um, Yeah, look, we had something weird happen and I saw an error message pop up on the, on the screen before and it's one that I'd seen before. It may be that impacted. I don't know. But let's continue with the news. So BAE Systems has released a new drone. So in a series of groundbreaking flight trials that took place over the skies above northwest Wales, the Magma unmanned aerial vehicle demonstrated some new um, flow control technologies, which they claim could revolutionise future aircraft design. Have you heard about this one at all, John? No, I haven't. Haven't a look at it. Um, no, that's um, that's a nice looking aircraft. So as this video plays out, I'm just getting the um, info back up on my screen. It's like a turbo jet. Yeah, jet yeah. engine. 
So they, um, they go on to say that um, they've incorporated technologies designed to improve the control and performance of the aircraft by replacing moving surfaces with simpler, as they call it, blown air solutions. Um, trials yeah, right. have paved the way for engineers to create better performing aircraft that are lighter, more reliable and cheaper to operate. Um, they say it could also improve an aircraft's stealth capabilities as they reduce the number of gaps and edges that currently make the aircraft more observable on radar. Well, it looks good on paper and it's flying. Yeah. That's one thing, and it? It's good. When you see it flying, you know they're getting something right. Yeah. Okay, we'll leave that one there. And as we move on today, I've got one more story in the news segment. So this one is a, um, a bit of an exclusive. Um, well, almost exclusive. We had some of this footage appearing um, on, a, on another live stream recently. Let's just play the clip. So here's the new DJI action camera, which they report can go underwater. We've got the professional and the mobile version. Mm. I'm kidding, guys. It's not really, of course. But um, I just wanted to put that up there for a bit of fun. But DJI have certainly announced an action camera. Yeah, yeah, waterproof. Most action cameras are waterproof, aren't they? Well, they're claiming their new camera is going to be waterproof. Um, they're trying to compete with GoPro, obviously. Um, there are some people who've got some leaked um, uh, evaluation copies of the camera, or uh, units of the camera, so lots of fun and stuff out there. But um, I, I, you know what I would really love to see, and it's interesting, you look back to one of DJI's former competitors, but not really much of a competitor um, in, in GoPro, the Karma. They had a good idea of um, getting a camera and an aircraft and mounting the camera on the aircraft. DJI, when we were looking at the Mavic um, 2 Pro, um, you know, the idea that people were thinking the Osmo camera was actually going to be interchangeable and actually fitting into into that camera that would have been really cool yeah it would look the gopro cameras are, are quite advanced i mean the karma fell over like the like a few of the others because the you know a lot of the specs on the aircraft weren't as good range um operating range endurance all of those things so dji kind of got you know hit the mark on that one but their cameras are just, you know, coming out of another factory. So, um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see where they're going to, um, where, you know, a DJI camera. I mean, I just thought they bought Hasselblad. Maybe maybe they're combined with the action camera um, as well. And so Hasselblad. Yeah. Anyway, that's um, all of our news today. And on... our guest is patiently waiting, very patiently. Our guest is patiently waiting. But you weren't here last week, John. I wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't here last week. So... Here's the news. The world has just been invaded by aliens. Their spokesman had only this to say. In the beginning, there was no news. And no news is good news. So there will be no news from now on. So there. So that's the end of our news segment for today. And now we move into the news-free zone and we'll say hello to our guest. Hello to Darren Smith from Saw. Hey, Darren, how you doing? Oops, we got to get his microphone up there. Oops. There we go. How you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, welcome. Thank you for, for joining us. So, Darren, tell me, what is Saw.Earth? Yeah, so Sword.Earth is a uh, platform for uh, the exchange of all types of remote sensing imagery. So that includes uh, drones to start, but also aerial imagery and satellite imagery. So um, I think the world's gotten used to things like Google Earth to where they can use uh, satellite imagery and, and get down to, I think it's about 30 centimeters uh, resolution. But of course, with drones, the resolution can go a lot higher. So we're looking to give uh, users um, the full picture as well as the people who provide that data. So in a way, we're sort of a, a one-stop shop for all those types of images. So so let's take a step back, right? So how mm -hmm. does this work end-to-end? -end? Someone has a drone, mm -hmm. they go and fly and they take pictures and they provide mm -hmm. that to your platform. What's in it for them? Uh, 
Well, there's, there's, uh, I guess the obvious thing is that um, it's a, it's a marketplace. So pe when people upload images uh, after creating a profile, they can set pricing on those images, and then everything's in the sort of in the um, in the system to where um, as soon as somebody purchases your image, you're notified, and then at the end of the month, you get paid out uh, for the images that sell on SOAR. So this is kind of like Uber for drone photography, kind of? Yeah, um, it's interesting that you, you mentioned, mentioned that um, because uh, down, down the track, we do have plans for, uh, if you will, the opportunity for people to request jobs. So if you were a landowner and you needed some imagery, um, some drone imagery, <coughs> you could actually put up a request to where uh, drone operators who met his criteria could come out and, and acquire that image, those images for you. Okay. So right now, today, our viewers, John, anyone here can go out and fly. They can upload their photos to your platform, set a price on it. Is there something where it kind of has suggested pricing based on markets of what you've seen in the past? Well, we want to implement, um, you know, recommended pricing, and um, it's really going to go on uh, what the what the demand is. And so, it was actually this week that um, Soar was was commercialized. So, we've had a, a working platform since late last year. It was about October um, to where people could use the platform and and bring their images up. And then it was actually last week that we uh, had finalized uh, the the payment system and and um, how you know how people get remunerated for um, their images, um, yeah. And so, the the one thing I definitely want to add is that um, we'd ask everyone who who takes images and put them up is to be um, you know safe and responsible. We realize that the laws are different wherever you are, um, America, Australia, places like Thailand. Definitely, um, yeah. we want you to to know what those rules are. Um, you know. Our, our interests are at stake, but as well, um, you and and the industry. You know, we're, we're we want we want the rest of the world to see drones in a positive light. Yeah. So just to be clear, right? The whole idea mm -hmm. of you photograph the stuff that you're already doing. Hypothetically, mm -hmm. you're already flying. You mm -hmm. take some photographs. You're already complying with the law and the regulations. After you get home, upload it, and you can get paid for the work. Sounds good to me so far. Let's have a quick look at it. We've got a video clip. Let's have a quick peek at that. Our world is changing and evolving. Something incredible is happening. Every week, every day, every hour. Wouldn't it be amazing if we were able to capture it all? At SOAR, we're building the future of all maps and imagery by sourcing the world's satellite, aerial and drone imagery into one single platform. We call it the Supermap. And we think it's about time. Unlike existing mapping systems, the SOAR Supermap is a dynamic, living map that is ever-changing. Interact with the world. Discover places you've never been. See how familiar ones have changed. Be there when Mother Nature hits. And see how humanity responds. In fact, SOAR is the perfect platform for just about anyone who wants to learn about their changing world. Start exploring today. Discover your Earth. So nice marketing video there. Let me um, just say uh, that drone, that spark that you were going to give away on Kelly's channel, has that been given away yet? We haven't announced the winner, but I think uh, Kelly's going to do that in a few days if he doesn't do it this weekend. Okay, okay. So definitely get into it. John, what, do you, what what's your thoughts? Oh, it's awesome. Fantastic. You know, I, I just love the way, um, you know, in this industry, people just uh get ideas and and run with them you know and and it, it's exciting to see I, I i just um you know i love seeing that stuff i love seeing it all come together too you're doing a great job 
Yeah, I had a chat with Darren um, before putting the show together, and I'd love to see kind of some next generation stuff as well as the platform develops. You've already mentioned the possibility of a, I want drone photography here. What would be, I think, really cool as well is something where you, your back end does some ortho stitching as a service, either as a direct thing that you pay for instead of someone else or potentially offset, offsetting your credits that you've already got for the images that you're selling using some of that credit. I don't know. Is that something you, where do you think that'll go? Yeah, I, th I definitely think that's in the pipeline in terms of um, giving giving opportunities for the we call them service providers, but um, drone 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 pilots and operators. Um, it, in the in the future, this platform will be more of a uh, to to use a phrase an Amazon marketplace for uh, for drone operators, aerial uh, aerial image providers, and satellite companies to where they can have a, a store, if you will. Um, and offering their their basically they they have a profile and they they have a store to where they can offer more than just images they could offer uh, stitched images so uh, right now images that we take are uh, uh, jpegs and png files but geotiffs obviously are of, are of good use to landowners or or land managers those types of people so mm -hmm. it's it's looking ahead to to more of what what drones can do and of course they're they're great for taking um, you know art we artistic or or one off um, type imagery. But as as you know, and as many of the other people uh, here today know that, that that there's more than just taking one image. You can stitch all those images and make three D models and and build terrain models and 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 do analysis from that. And it I'll, I'll be quick here, but we're a we're a geospatial company from the start, and so we've been making mapping products and. That's what led us into using drone imagery. We were always using drone imagery to map things on, and and so drones are the tool to to capture um, that map information. Yeah, look, interesting topic. And um, as you know, we we certainly like to um, have some fun with our guests, and it's about that time. Let's just. Click the button to my beautiful Ladies producer. and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's time to play Stop the Yank. <coughs> okay, here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's that time that you love that the Americans hate. No, they don't. They love it. They're having a bit of fun. They're good sports. It's time to play Stump the Yank. And today's special contestant, Darren, welcome. How you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks, Greg. So, Darren, this is a little bit of an interesting one. You've been living in Australia for how long now? 13 years. 13 years living oh, in Australia. Man. So I had to think really, really hard. What can I do to stump an Australian resident that comes from America and... Um, I actually got inspiration this morning. I was um, watching the ABC news feed come in on my iPhone and um, I saw this photo in my news feed. It's a photo of Lake Eyre. Let's just chuck that up. It's coming. It's coming. There we go. Beautiful photo, first of all, from the ABC, the photo of Lake Eyre. And contain Lake Eyre, just for those who are not Australians, contains... The lowest natural point in Australia at approximately 15 metres below sea level. And on the rare occasions that it fills, it's the largest lake in Australia, covering 9,500 square kilometres. So Lake Eyre is filling at the moment thanks to flood water in Queensland in January. However, we're still in drought in much of Australia. So with that introduction, let's go back to the normal screen now. There is a famous poem in Australia that Aussies of my generation were taught when, when we went to school. I'm going to read you the first line. Your challenge is to tell me either the author, the name, or one of the other lines that follow. Okay, I love a sunburned country. I love a Banjo. sunburned country. Yeah. I'm going to take a stab. Banjo Patterson. Oh! <clears throat> You do know an Aussie, Aussie poet, but no, Dorothea McKellar, My Country is the name of the poem. And this is actually the second stanza. I love a sunburnt country, a land of sweeping plains, of 
ragged mountain ranges of droughts and flooding rains. I love her far horizons. I love her jewel sea, her beauty and her terror, the wide brown land for me. I um, always thought that was Banjo Patterson myself. No. <laughs> I would have got that wrong. Yeah, there you go. I would have got that wrong. And Ozzy gets that wrong. So that was the question from me. And um, Spike, one of our regulars, sent in a couple of questions as well. And these are the easier ones to get now. These are the multi-choice one. How long is the longest fence in Australia? Is it A, 5,530 kilometres, B, 7,255 kilometres, or C, 4,895 kilometres? She is tough today, man. Mm, it is tough. Wow. Can I just give you the name of the fence? Oh, that's good. Yeah, let's have that. I don't know. Try that. that. Yeah, rabbit proof fence. What is it? Rabbit proof fence? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know the answer to that because this question came from Spike, but the answer is um, answer is A, which is 5,530 yeah. kilometres. And if uh, it is the uh, rabbit proof uh, fence. It is the rabbit proof fence. There you go. So you, you, got, you didn't get the right answer, but you knew about it, yeah. so that's good. Now, yeah. now, since you're an American, last question yeah. from Spike. Texas is the largest state in the continental United States, and Western Australia, the place where you now live, is the largest state in Australia. How many times larger is Western Australia than Texas? Answer A is two times, B is three times, or C is four times? Ooh. Well, that's where you live, man. It is. It is. Uh, and Spike, sorry, Alaska is much bigger than Texas. Um, and I'm going to say West Australia is four times bigger than Texas. So the answer to that question was B, three times. Ah. But that's extra fun enough. fact. Extra fun fact that Texas has 13 times as many people compared to Western Australia. Wow. Okay. Do I get credit, I get credit for um, knowing that Alaska is bigger than Texas? Yeah. yeah I'll okay. I'll, gi I'll give you that one. <laughs> I'll give you that one. So what I'm going to ask, stick around in the chat, say hello to some of the people that are watching and um, answer some of their questions. Maybe they want to uh, sign up at SOAR. Now, we did speak about potentially doing a live demo of the platform of uploading some images, but at the end of the day, from a drone pilot site, everyone knows how to upload files to a website. So that's pretty, pretty easy, pretty basic. And um, yeah, have a chat to the guys there. And um, yeah, thank you very, very much for being our guest. Okay, well, thanks, Greg. Great to be here. Thanks, Darren. So, John, we, we did originally talk about having a um, topic of navigation as our next topic. Sure. Um, now, and then I didn't, there was something wrong with my computer where I couldn't get something up on the screen today. But let me ask you the question. Sorry, my wife is asking me something. Yes, you can click that button. <laughs> um, so navigation, VTC, VNC, on route, and all of these kind of terms. Today, all I want to ask and chat about is the different types of charts. And hopefully next week, I'll get it up on the screen and we can have a look at it and dig into it a little bit. What is a VTC and a VNC and an on route? Okay, so really for us, the main one is the VTC. Um, it's, it stands for Visual Terminal Chart. And a Visual Terminal Chart is when airspace gets very busy, um, we have a, a terminal area chart or a TAC, which pilots use commercially. Uh, they're flying, you can use it in all weather. Um, it's actually a, an IFR chart or instrument flight rules chart. But a VATC is a Visual Terminal Chart. And this is what um, pilots use when there are visual conditions and they're flying in a Cessna or a, a, a helicopter or whatever it is at lower levels and using um, visual navigation as the primary source of navigation. So these days, of course, GPS, uh, you know, like our cars, we, um, we use GPS extensively in all aircraft, even uh, ultralight aircraft um, using GPS extensively um, to help us navigate. But um, a visual terminal chart uh, alerts you to all sorts of things in terms of, of um, other airspace users. So hang gliders are marked on a VTC where they might be operating. 
you have little restricted areas or lanes of entry for seaplane ports, um, mm-hmm. uh, helicopter landing sites, uh, all, all sorts of manner of things. Now, of course, a, a commercial jet that's flying into a major airport, uh, all these things are going on well under their airspace. And so they don't need that charts with that information. It'd be too much. So the densification of a chart uh, make, it has to do with the relevance of the type of operation it is. So you know, t- using a tack chart or a normal chart that a, a heavy jetliner would use, very, very different. They're all the same, pretty much the same the world over. There are mm-hmm. a couple of different publishers. So um, Jeppesen are a company that publish charts which cover the entire globe. Um, so a lot of airlines use Jeppesen charts because they're, once you're reading one chart, uh, it's a piece of asphalt on the ground. Mm-hmm. It has approach procedures and they're similar all over the world. So that that simplifies things for pilots flying around. Now, in visual So, term, so for, for those visual charts, someone who's a drone pilot, let's yep. mark down about half a dozen different quick points that a drone pilot's going to look at on those charts. Well, straight away on a VTC, a drone pilot would see a symbol of a hang glider um, at a coastal region. So if you look at the Sydney VTC, which you can download for free, off the uh, Air Services Australia website. Have a look at the chart. You'll see on the northern beaches of Sydney, where I live, there are hang gliders marked along the coastal region. So if you are taking off, there's the first one. You're taking off from there. It also marks the seaplane routes um, and scenic routes. So there's a scenic route that VFR pilots use down the coast. They fly from Palm Beach all the way down into the harbour area at 500 feet. Um, So these are places you avoid? There's a place you avoid, and, and you know what, in, even flying, a lot of people fly drones at our beaches. It's a beautiful place to fly, but you need to be aware that there are there's a lot of coastal traffic, whether it's hang gliders or light aircraft doing sightseeing, mm. so forth. a lot of coastal traffic, and so keeping down, um, well, you know, under 400 feet or below will give you that extra. Sometimes they'll be lower. They will come uh, in lower, but you need to be um, aware of those And if you're near a helicopter. So helicopter landing site hang gliders, other traffic, coastal traffic um, is important to see. The Most of the stuff around a, a city like ours is coastal. Um, there's a, you know, most of the dense, denser traffic is coastal. Heavy jetliners, if you're nowhere near an airport, you don't worry about them much. They're well and truly um, mm. above where we're operating. Um, so it is the low-level traffic. So the VTC gives you that information. Also, the other thing that's very easy to pick up off there is the frequency. So if you have a handheld um, VHF receiver, um, and I recommend that even recreational pilots um, have one of these and listen to it. Not When you're not flying, switch on in the area. If, say, you're flying near home, a local park, you'll start to hear the regular calls. And here they're a seaplane base. So we hear, you know, Romeo and Mike Echo. We hear the other airport departing Palm Beach. And we know in three minutes he's going to be overhead. So you get used to the um, uh, the regular traffic that's in your area. Um, and if you've got, as I say, if you've got an airport uh, or a helicopter base nearby, you'll hear the frequency that they're using that area. So it's a handy so, thing. And the, the VTC yeah. has that. So just a quick little tip for Aussies on the channel. Um, if you want to get access to a VTC, go to Air Services Australia to their website. Air Services Australia, and once you're there, have a look for NAIPS, N-A-I-P-S. Yep. What does that stand for again? National? Uh, information Publication um, Service or something. But we have, there's all sorts of acronyms, you know, there's uh, URSA is in Root Supplement. Yeah. Um, we, we have the AIP, um, is, a, is Aeronautical Information Publication. The AIP is the full set. Of, of, if you like, documents that club all the visual stuff or the instrument stuff. So the AIP is a generic thing. URSA is an en route supplement for supplementing um, VFR flights. And, and you know, as a, again, you know, there's, we've only got a handful or two handfuls, really, of uh, airports in Australia that handle commercial jet traffic. Um, yeah. yeah perhaps, perhaps 15 or 20, um, yeah. uh, actually, but the rest of the country is is visual terminal. Now, once we get outside the city area, so you know, the VTC only covers the higher density areas. Once we go outside that, we use what we call a WAC chart. A world aeronautical chart is a basic um, terrain chart. It shows the aerodromes. It shows spot heights. Um, it's a very uh, generic chart. Um, 
unlike the um, the VTC, which is a, a, a different scale, once we get closer in scale, the map, the large map shows a small area, they use what we call a transverse Mercator projection. And that means that the, mm-hmm. the whole map, it's exactly a transverse Mercator. And what they do with that is, so because of the way the Earth is curved, when we, when we flatten it out, we actually adjust. Because you think about it, if you've got to measure distance across a map, and you've taken a curved surface and you've flattened it out, then the distances are going to be different. And so yeah. on, we use different um, mapping uh, technologies, if you like, so that the scale is correct. So the World mm. Aeronautical Chart um, is, is a, a, a much diff- a bigger scale, um, but again, it shows all the information. So uh, there's, not, there's plenty of reading on this actually on the internet and, um, and some uh, videos that explain it if you're interested in airspace. But, of Hmm. course, going back to your question about navigation, um, airspace awareness is best always going to be handled by the VTC um, uh, chart in your area. Have a look at it. And, you know, uh, don't be overwhelmed by the amount of information on it. Have a look at the areas that you like to fly and see if you can pick out symbols and um, you'll see controlled airspace there. So you'll say you'll see things like LL2500. An LL2500, just in, in large letters, means lower limit of the controlled airspace is 2,500 feet. So you yeah. might see that. In my area, um, that's what it is. But if you go further north, away, further away up north there, you'll see LL3500 and 6500. And so they're, they're not very relevant. But, um, a, again, looking at the legend for the map and the key, you'll, you'll get a lot you of information off that. Absolutely. Yeah. They're very extensive. They're well... Uh, written. These are legal documents. These are legal navigation documents. They are very, very well done. You're not going to see the kind of shoddy work that we see on some apps these days that um, that are very poor in, in their information. A VTC is, is the real deal. Yeah. So I might um, chuck up a video in the next week or so telling people how to log into air services, jump across to NAPES and where to find the VTC, the current most recent one. It's available for download inside NAPES and Throw that up, and then maybe next week we can have a look at one of those and chat about some of the some of the detail Absolutely. on there. Yeah. Speaking of the charts, I've d- got something in my hand over here. Um, I'm just going to try and there we go. I don't know if you can see it or not, but flight yoke for I've been getting into um, X plane, and there's the flight yoke and um, the switch panel for that. So if any of our regulars are interested in X plane um, or interested in flying of something bigger than a drone. It's a lot of fun. I've been having a great time with it. There we go. So definitely encourage people to go and have a look at that. Have you, you, you played with much Sim, John? I did. My father's a very much a Sim uh, a guy. He's got uh, built the cockpit and everything else. He's got a fully blown Sim with all of the USB, the radio links and everything. And I use it because... Every time I've got an instrument rating renewal come up, I've got to go and fly. I jump in there. It's great. I can shoot a few approaches. Um, I, it, the simulators are great for procedural things. Um, yeah. And so you can either fly it around and just have fun and do loop the loops and crash it into the ground, or you can actually, rather than um, uh, concentrating on just the fun flying bit, practice the procedural start. So that's uh, the radio calls, the um, airways clearance limitations, and pulling up your charts. Um, I find it great for that, you know. So I, I just um, I'll get the weather on the day, download the actual weather, feed it into the sim so that it's um, realistic. Other times we'll put some nasty weather in um, when we want to when we want to practice that as well. Do an ILS or or a, uh, an RNAV approach, but yeah. um, particularly when we changed over to GPS approaches a few years ago, I was on the sim regularly to to just see, get get used to what it looks like. It's a very different type of approach. It requires, um, you know, a couple of things that, that we hadn't seen before um, in terms of approaches. They're great. They're fantastic to do, and there's lots of them. Australia led the way in developing um, widespread RNAV approaches all over the country mm. um, yeah. in a model, but but it was something I'd, we'd never seen before, so we had to learn it from scratch, and the sim was the way to do it. You don't need to go up in the airplane and burn a whole lot of kerosene. Um, to, to learn procedures, you can sit it in, in your lounge room um, and go through it slowly and, and methodically. Yeah. Okay, so let's leave that alone for now. We'll move on. We've got two more sections of the show today. The first one is a really cool section that a lot of people like because 
we're going to give something away. Yay. So in my hand, I've got a glare shield for um, an iPhone style device or um, an Android equivalent. So this one's going up today. Right now, we're going to give it away live on the show today. Now, we've got something a little bit new. So what I'm going to do is ask everyone in the chat room to pick a number between 1 and 99. Throw the number in the chat room right now. How many people have we got in chat, by the way? Can you see that from where you are, John? I can't see that today. Yeah. Uh, a technological hiccup here with my chat feed, but that's all right. Let me see if I Just can find that. having a look. That. Can you see it? YouTube slash Oz by Drone. So what we're going to do, and we'll have a quick practice run now. Do you want to press that button for me to my producer? Wheel of Fortune. So the closest number to what comes up that I see in the chat is what we're going to go with. Now, if we had more people in the chat and we had a lot of problems today, let's just clear that shot, go back to A1. Or that. Um, if we had more people in the chat today, I would... Oh, that's my bad. We're having lots of fun at the moment. So I'm going to give that another spin in a minute. The numbers between 1 and 100 and the closest to that by the time we go. Okay. You can put in multiple answers as well. Let's go for an exact answer. Oh, clear A1. I don't know where it's coming from. There we go. Sorry about all of that. Put in multiple answers. The close, the actual exact number is what we're going to go with. And we're going to spin the wheel again. We're going to spin it one more time. And the first person to type in the correct number that's on the wheel wins the uh, glare shield for a mobile phone that you can use on pretty much any drone. Let's go with it. Let's go. Here's the wheel. Okay, it's either 22 or 11. The answer is 11. Now, you can still type it in now. So the first person to type in 11 now, if it's not already up there, wins. We'll clear that shot. Waiting, waiting. Who's the winner going to be? It's suspense. Everyone's typing now. And the winner is the Grumpy Vlogger. <laughs> Congratulations, Grumps. I'll be sending this off to you. Fantastic. And, um, we did have another competition running, which was um, for the Katie Foe um, holder for a Osmo Pocket. That one has been a little bit delayed. I had um, some filming issues with what I was preparing to do with that, so... I'm going to try and give that another go in the next week or so, but we'll give that away very, very shortly. Okay, and now we reach the fun part of the show. It's time for... And our titles are not working at the moment, so Explore Australia. We'll go without the title today. Let's play this week's Explore Australia. First video today comes from Drones Be Heard. This is the old bridge at Fremantle, opened on 15th of December 1939. It was intended to be used only for a few years, but remained in service ever since, taking traffic from Fremantle to iconic landmarks of North Fremantle, like the Mojo's and Old Bridge Cellars and the Rose Hotel. Its days are pretty much numbered, so um, enjoy that one as we move into our Second one, this one's from Paul Picuin. This is Paul's very first ever drone video. So congratulations, Paul. And um, before we continue with talking about that, please do go and check out the channels of all of these creators. Their links are in the description to the video. Paul has um, made this one in Bustleton in Western Australia. So close to our friend Darren over in that part of the country. First time flying a drone while filming previously operated a drone camera 
while someone else was a pilot. So I'm assuming he was doing um, an Inspire shot with that one. Put this um, short video together of some of the footage that he captured and um, he says he'll be exploring that further for sure. Beautiful colors. So just a reminder to our American friends that um, the sharks that we saw at the beginning of the show aren't everywhere when you come to visit Australia. So we've got some beautiful waterway shots here. You can definitely go and enjoy Australian water without fearing sharks everywhere you go. Don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is the American deterrent to come to Australia after all, but yeah. This one's from Michael Dobley. This is the Nerum Creek Bush Retreat. Um, he says it's a quick fly over the retreat campgrounds. Great camping site about 1.5 hours north of Brisbane. Dog friendly and the great family atmosphere. And um, see if you can pick the drone, John. Based on the photography, I want you to pick the lens. Pick the drone. Uh. Yeah, it's, oh, it's, like, it's between a Mavic or a Phantom. What I think would you say? A, I'm thinking it's a Phantom. It is, yeah. So this has been an interesting discussion over the last few weeks with um, all of the leaked stuff this way and that way about Phantom 4s and Phantom 4 Pros, I should say, being unavailable. The, the fact remains that to get some of the absolutely incredible footage that you see out of the um, Phantom series, we, we need a successor. Um, the Mavic 2, You have you still got yours, John? Yep. Yeah, we've still got a Mavic 2 Pro and Phantom 4s. Um, we've got, you know, we've got about 12 aeroplanes here, the mixture of them all. But the interesting thing that I, I, I love telling this story, you sold your Phantoms because you thought the Mavic 2 Pro was going to be your your workhorse drone going yeah, forward. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We, well, it, it did. It certainly didn't cover the survey work, and so um, the Mavic the Mavic's not an ideal airplane for survey, and it's purely because of the shutter. The mechanical shutter on the Phantom is better, um, and takes. Uh, mind you, when you step up to a Fox Tech camera again, it's like chalk and cheese. Mapping cameras are, are starting to really take hold now. So I don't know whether. Oops, John's frozen there. We'll come back to him in a minute. This next video from Oz Beach Andy in Western Australia by drone. Twilight Beach Road, um, arguably um, the best beaches in the world, according to him, and I'm not going to disagree. Absolutely beautiful. Esperance on the south coast of Western Australia hosts an abundance of extraordinary beauty in some of the world's most pristine coastline. Nowhere else can you savour the endless stretches of easily accessible beaches that boast the brightest, whitest sand and crystal clear turquoise waters. Now, since John is um, frozen there, I'm going to get my producer to reactivate the other microphone of our guest who's still sitting around in the background so we can have someone else to have a chat with. Better than me being... Yeah, hey, welcome back. Yeah, Western Australia. Have you done much coastline exploration over your 13 years? I, I have, um, definitely the Southwest. So uh, those shots earlier of Bustleton. And mm. um, I haven't been around this far. Esperance is uh, a good drive from Perth, but I've gone, I've gone north, uh, Calvary and Carnarvon, and even north of that, um, which, is, which is pretty spe spectacular um, scenery. Yeah. I mean, certainly if you've got some footage, send it our way. We'll, we'll feature it next week or the week after. We'd love to see some of your own flying. Certainly, I'll, I'll do that, Greg. Yeah. What would you say to those non-Aussies that have got your accent watching today? Well, I, I would say, um, you know, we, we started a bit of a promotion where we were going to try and get some uh, influencers down here and, and basically acquire images, um, partly in, in collaboration with the Tourism WA. 
And the good thing about places like WA is that it's wide open. Perth's a big city, but once you get outside of Perth, um, you can basically put the drone up and you're not gonna uh, be flying over people or buildings or roads. And um, you're gonna get more of that scenery like we saw of, um, of Esperance. Yeah. And, Just and briefly um, to interrupt, um, the final video that we're looking at now today is from Matt North, who was in the chat room earlier today. I don't know if you're still there, Matt, but if you are, hello and great, great footage. This was shot with a DJI Spark at Purling Brook Falls um, in the Springbrook National Park. And he says, couldn't get much flying in on this day due to another day of Addy mode. Um, but I'm looking at him saying that were those words, and then I'm looking up at the screen and seeing beach footage. So I might have got my notes out of sequence. So ignore what I just said, but sooner or later, we're going to see Maddie's footage. So this is something else, and it's really good, whatever it is. <laughs> I, yeah, I agree, Greg. And, and in fact, I, uh, I took a spark out filming some surfers in Margaret River. Um, and they were, you know, 100 meters offshore. And, and uh, what's great about that is, is yeah, you get images like this, and um, you just throw it in your backpack when you're done. Interesting topic on that is the rumored um, next drone between a Spark and a Mavic Air. Certainly, the Mavic Air hasn't been as popular as it might otherwise be. Um, l largely, I think, due to the noise and, um, you know, people are not turned on by that. But, um, you know, the rumours are that we're going to have a really nice foldable Spark drone coming soon. So that would be absolutely awesome. That was apparently Matt North's video right at the end there. Um, at the Springbrook, Springbrook National Park. I think it was his video. We didn't have another one. I thought I'd missed one. Never mind. So we've reached the end of the show and I've got my guest here again. Are there any other questions for, um, for, for you from our, our, our audience in the chat room since we've still got you back here? Has anyone, um, have, have people heard of Saw.Earth before? Um, are they... I'm just laughing at the grumpy vlogger. It's not the spark. He's going to call it the spare drone, the spare. <laughs> um, have people heard of Saw.Earth? Have, have you submitted images to that platform before? Um, love to hear from people on that one. And while people are answering that question, I'm going to get my producer to re-enable shot A1 in just a moment. There we are. I've just got to turn all this stuff off. There we go. Let's have a look at the chat room. Nothing there yet. So while people are um, putting their thoughts in, let me um, wrap up with a couple of our community service announcements at the end of the show. If you would like to send in a video to us, there's an email address, upload at gregkunit.com. If um, you could do us a little bit of a favor, there's our social media. YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook, please do um, like and share our pages and our tweets and Facebook posts. That really helps our channel to grow. Our postal address, if you'd like to send us anything, is 5 slash 127 Princess Highway, Sylvania. And if John was here, he would right now be talking about drone camp. So later on this year, and who knows, we might even ask Darren to come over and visit at the time. Um, tell our little droners how to go and make some money off flying their drone. Young teenagers, even they would be eligible on your platform? Yeah, definitely, Greg. Um, it's interesting you mentioned that. I saw that in the new, we didn't get a chance to talk about the new regulations, but um, as far as uh, registering your drone, and I read that um, drone operators under 16 had to be ac accompanied by a registered drone operator or an accredited mm. drone operator, which is a bit disconcerting because. Uh, Certainly we get images from, um, from people, you know, teenagers that take great shots and have the, uh, I guess the, um, you know, the, the desire to get into it. So, um, yeah, no, we, we have no, no age limitations. Yeah. So certainly, for example, um, someone who's flying with a Tello, which is under the, um, under the weight class for the regulations, that they could definitely legally fly. 
whether or not the image quality from Atello is going to be good enough for what you're doing on your platform might be questionable. But since it's an open free market space, who knows, they might capture something pretty amazing anyway. Yeah, I think that's that's definitely achievable. I um, I can't remember the specs on the on the resolution, but um, if anything, it's it's a great way to to get in get into drones and and start uh, getting your skills down. Yeah, I, I've got a question in the chat room. Will Saw be open for the public to look at, kind of like Google Earth? So, how do people browse and find something that they like on your platform? Yeah, great question. So to start, when you when you drop into um, Soar.Earth, it takes you to a map and it shows you, um, I guess, cards or browsers of where all all the images are. There's a lot of pins on the maps, and then you can go and you can click on those pins to find where the images are. And uh, we have there's there's images coming in from um, wherever. Some countries obviously you can't get drone images, so. You won't see images there, but you can scroll around the map, and it and it sits on top of either a Google Maps or Mapbox uh, background, and you can find the images. So, um, I guess a, a use would be if you were using Soar and or you're using something like Google Earth, and and there's um, perhaps an image that's of uh, a farmland or a building that's a couple of years old. We'll go on to Soar and see if there's updated imagery, because in fact the imagery is going to be um, dated, and and you could see both um, when the image is taken and, and, and at high resolution. So that's probably the entry point for SOAR. And there's also a, a browse. So similar to other things like even uh, Instagram, uh, actually it's called Explore, but um, you're given a gallery of all the images and they're, they're sequential. So if you put up an image, um, say this morning, it's going to be at the top of the list. Mm, okay. Um, I've got one more question. Um, someone's asking about being part 107 certified in the US, required or not? Or you don't want to answer? Well, yeah, it's, it's um, that, 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 that's a hard one to answer. And um, I, I think, I think if, you're, if you're actively, if that's your business and you're making um, you know, money flying drones, then you probably already are. And I guess the other comment is that um, we all love this, I don't know what the cost is to get uh, you know certified over there, but we all love this this sport or or hobby, and um, probably the best way to support it, or one good way to support it, is is to get that that training so that um, you know if anybody approaches you, you're more knowledgeable than them, and you can you can share your knowledge with them, and as well you'll have um, I guess the you know just the the wherewithal to know when it's a good time to take images. And, and probably mm. when you shouldn't take images. So I would yeah. say just go out and, and get that certification if it's not too expensive, um, and then you're in the clear. Yeah, I mean, here's an interesting question. I, I, have, I don't know the US regulations well enough, um, but the difference between making money and making profit. If you could very clearly state that a YouTuber who's making a couple of bucks off it, but they've, you know, to, to do that, they've, invested X amount of dollars in their aircraft, they're not making profit and therefore they're not making money. That's something that we would need to get clarification from the FAA. I've previously heard people that it's um, a little bit more restrictive if you make any income, regardless of making profit. But I think it'd be, I, I think it'd be a smart thing for the FAA to do to review that and change it so that it's actually talking about making profit. At the moment, I think your platform would be really good for hobbyists to have some fun to get into it. But at the point that they actually say, hey, I've got to put this on my income tax return, that's when they need to start thinking about FAA certification. But that's just my opinion. Yeah, and I guess the other thing comes down to uh, even, even liability and um, hopefully the price of of insuring yourself will will come down as as more people seek to do it. But um, you know, worst case scenario, if you were to car crash a drone into a vehicle or something like that, it could end up costing you quite a bit. And that's that's something that um, maybe we just don't think about when we're flying a drone. That that you you do have something that that could uh, cause a headache for a lot of people. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's all we've got time for today. Um, thank you very much for being our guest and our instant fill-in co-host for the end of the show. Lovely having you on and um, we'll have you back again at some time in the future. Thank you very much, Greg.
Okay, everyone, thanks for watching. Hit the thumbs up button. After the video is uploaded, put a comment in there. It helps us in our visibility. And one last thing, we've got 150 hours left to hit our target of 4,000 watch hours. So keep watching the videos and um, thanks very much for watching today. Bye for now.